Hi, good evening. Uh, I'm Rani Avisar. I'm the dean of the school. It's my uh, great pleasure to uh, welcome everybody for this uh, additional fourth lecture, I believe, this year of this uh, 2023 series of SC Secrets. We are glad that uh, you are joining us for the lectures of Dr. Arye Elfenbein. It's going to be, I can promise you, it's going to be a fascinating uh, uh, lecture. It's going to be helping us how, uh, to understand and uh, how his uh, company is in fact well in its way to becoming one of the first to take a lab culture fish product uh, to market. That's uh, kind of the you know, science fictions of uh, food production that is not anymore science fiction. It's very, very interesting. Uh, we would like to take a moment to thank our uh, Sea Secret sponsors. And uh, the presenting sponsor is the Bank of America and uh, the Shepard Broad Foundation. Uh, Bill Galway, who is uh, sitting with us always uh, here. And uh, good to have you, Bill. Cheryl also who is our uh, uh, main executive producer for this series. She's um, helping us identifying all the speakers and deserves a lot of credit uh, for all the speakers that uh, she has been able to identify and, and bring. So thanks, Cheryl, really appreciate it. Uh, we have the KB Life Enhancement Forum, the Kibiscan Community Foundation, the John McCann uh, Family Foundation, Gail uh, Nansen, in honor of uh, Russell Nansen. Thanks for coming, Gail. We really uh, are very happy that uh, you were able to make to the, to the presentation. Nicole and Myron Wang, and Southern Glazer Wine and Spirit. As you know, uh, before we have our main speaker for the evening, we have a tradition now to uh, uh, try to recruit one of our successful alumni to come and make a short presentation uh, before the main one. And tonight, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing you and uh, welcoming back Patrick Ryan, Dr. Patrick Ryan, an alumnus of the Rosenstiel School with a PhD in applied marine physics in 2016. I can't believe it's already that long, Patrick. But it's great to see, to see you back here. He's the founder and CEO of Waterlust, a company that uses its product as a science communication tools. Patrick specializes in fostering interdisciplinary spaces that blend business, science, engineering, policymaker, sociology, and art together, and drives solutions to the environment crisis. Waterless currently supports 20 different causes and donates 10% of profit from each line to support high impact um, uh, research and education, including our own uh, shark research and conservation lab and Sustain, which is one of the labs uh, that uh, we have here at the school that is capable of simulating Hurricane Force 5 uh, events. Welcome, Patrick. A great pleasure to see you back here. Thank you, Dean Avasar. It's always an honor to come back to Rasmus, and um, I just have a lot of um, very fond feelings of this campus. Um, we're going to show you a brief video that uh, Bloomberg did about our company, Waterlust, um, but just sort of briefly, um, I think it's important to, to kind of highlight that Waterlust was born on this campus, and, and that's a very special thing. I think that the, the, the culture that we have at Rasmus is so you know interdisciplinary it's so fostering creativity it's a kind of place that allows you know graduate students like me to not only work on um you know tidal inlet physics with my one of the scientists co here he was my, one of my advisors um, but also allows me to work on some weird ideas <clears throat> that turn into clothing companies that advocate for marine science so um, it's just rasmus is a very special place a rosenstiel school has something very special that brings um things out of its students. And I, I was telling Deanna, you know, we, we had 12 interns that we brought in from, from the Rosenstiel School a few years ago, and we ended up offering um, jobs to uh, five of them. And so percentage-wise, that's pretty darn high, and it worked so well that that's sort of our go-to employment strategy moving forward. But um, it's a very, very special place, and I really appreciate all the support that you offer the school because it enables students like me to do things like this. So. 
I think that the ocean is so unique and that water's for everybody. Doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter how much money you make. I love that accessibility. It's important for humanity and for our health and for our happiness, and we've got to protect it. My name is Patrick Rin. I am a marine scientist and the CEO of Waterlust. Waterlust is a small direct-to-consumer e-commerce apparel brand. We work to bring science into people's lives in creative ways, and we do that through the production and selling of creative clothing. When I first moved down here, I was a full-time sailor. I was actually on the US Olympic sailing team, and I was seeing all the things that were happening in the ocean, you know, the pollution, the environmental issues. Ultimately, I decided to go do a PhD instead and stop sailing competitively. I felt like, man, I, I really need to do something about this. I need to contribute in some way. And that's why we started Waterlust, was to experiment and figure out ways that we can bring science literacy um, into the general public's life in a, in a creative and fun and engaging way. So at Waterlust, we specialize in what we call advocate apparel. We design these beautiful, um, attention-grabbing, um, biologically accurate representations of a species or ecosystem in need. Currently, we support 16 different causes through our Advocate Apparel program. Our whale shark line support a international organization called the Marine Megafauna Foundation. They basically work on better understanding whale sharks, which are the largest species of fish in the world. Our sea turtle products advocate specifically for uh, green sea turtles, but we like to think that they kind of represent all of the sea turtles, most of which are endangered. Our Sunkiss line of products advocate for coastal resilience, so things like sea level rise, more frequent and intense storms because of climate change. Our abalone line of products is one of my most favorite because abalone are a sea snail and they have these really beautiful shells. And we're really working on restoring habitat, kelp forests, bringing abalone back into the wild. We're hoping that people stop you and go, what is that thing that you're wearing? And you go, oh, this is a whale shark or a sockeye salmon or an abalone. And you start having conversations about that species and help spreading you know, scientific knowledge in your community. Waterlust has four full-time employees and we're all family. And we all wear multiple different hats. Everyone's got to contribute to whatever the daily challenges are of that day. Incorporating sustainability into our business is paramount for us. From the type of paper we use in our office, and the raw materials we use, the shipping materials we use, the shipping processes we use. We work really closely with our, our fabric mills and we source 100% recycled uh, materials from the United States and uh, we basically turn recycled bottles into fabric. We get tons of feedback. Our customers are sort of our eyes and ears on the ground in terms of what are the issues happening in their community, what species should we be advocating for next. And so it's this kind of ongoing dialogue between the brand and the community. A lot of it has to do with solving what you can solve where you live. What's most important is that people do their best, that people are trying, they're engaged, and they're identifying ways that they can contribute and help us create a more resilient tomorrow. Thank you very much. Appreciate Bloomberg, and then also is, uh, Josh, who's a local. He's very related to the to the Rasmus community. Produced that video, and um, if you have any questions, I'll be around. I put some cards out on the uh, entrance table with my email on it, and if you ever have any questions or anything, um, feel free to to reach out. But thanks so much. Appreciate it. Have a great night. Thanks, Patrick. Congratulations on Waterless success, and thank you for supporting the Rosensteel School. We really appreciate that. Your accomplishment as an entrepreneur and scientist demonstrate the unlimited opportunities available to Rosensteel graduate. Uh, student education is vital in our uh, school's missions, and scholarships allow us uh, to recruit the best and brightest students. 
uh, and rich students who normally could not afford a, a private university such as ours to pursue their degrees uh, within one of our strategic initiatives. If you are interested to support that mission, um, any of the funds, uh, please uh, contact our executive director of advancement, Jennifer Dillon, and uh, her email is provided uh, right there. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce to you uh, tonight the speaker, Dr. Arie, Arie Elfenbein. Uh, Dr. Elfenbein is the co-founder of uh, WildType, a biotech company that has developed brewery-like system to grow cuts of seafood directly from cells. He leads a team of world-class scientists, engineers, nutrition experts, and entrepreneurs with a collective passion for pioneering a new way of putting fish on the table. Dr. Elfenbein earned an MD and PhD at Dartmouth and Kyoto University and completed his clinical training in internal medicine and cardiology at Yale. Prior to co-founding WildType, Dr. Elfenbein completed a fellowship in cardiovascular regenerative medicine at the Gladstone Institute at UC San Francisco. Classically trained uh, a cardiologist and musician, he continues to practice critical care medicine and piano when he's away from uh, uh, wild type. Arie, welcome to Sea Secret. Thank you for agreeing to come. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to say thank you to Dean Avisar, to everyone at Rosensteel. Um, this has been such an incredible day. I feel really, really honored to have been asked to come speak about um, the, the kinds of sea secrets that we have discovered um, in San Francisco, working with the cells of some of the most incredible animals uh, on the planet. And I'm, I'm really excited to tell you about what our journey has been like, um, and also to hear your thoughts, to hear your questions. Um, so I think that you know, where, where this all began was, was really with a question that maybe many of us are asking these days, which is, do we need another source of seafood? And even if you're not familiar with the numbers that I'll show, I think the trends are ones that will come as no surprise. I think that the fact that the oceans store most of the carbon on the planet um, is, is something that we've all come to appreciate in a very different way in recent years. Um, and the sustainability of our current fishing practices are ones that have landed the oceans in some degree of, of trouble. Um, you know, I, I, I think that some of the conventional fishing practices, when we would think about the connection that they have to carbon emissions, weren't clear um, or weren't immediately apparent. And in recent years, we've been able to quantify some of that. And there's this, this stunning article that was published in Nature a couple of years ago that essentially showed that you know, deep sea trawling, uh, this industry standard of dragging city-sized nets across the bottom of the ocean, will contribute as much carbon to the atmosphere as all of the airplanes in the world combined. And it's the, these types of, uh, you know, just the, the sort of like understanding of, of these deleterious consequences that have just made us wonder, is there another way to, to create the foods that, that we love? When it comes to aquaculture, it was incredible today to see some of the research that's been done here to visit the hatchery and, and actually really connect on the, the biology of these amazing, these amazing fish. And what we've found is that a lot of the coastal sites for aquaculture are becoming more limited as some of these waters warm. Um, and you know, where this all kind of plays out in the end is if you look at just the prices of salmon and just think about accessibility as an overall mission. Uh, when you adjust for inflation, so you can see the consumer price index there, this is what we've seen uh, even before our most re recent inflation spike. And so what I wanted to present to you today um, is what we've been working on um, in our little home in San Francisco, which is um, to, to create salmon in a different way. 
Um, I was asked to describe a little bit about what the journey was, uh, you know, as um, in, in the introduction, coming from medicine, uh, it wouldn't be an immediately apparent career choice to be thinking about growing salmon. Uh, and yet, it's one that seems to, at every step, just, just really make sense. And so where it began for me and, and my co-founder, Justin, was for me, I came from the world of, of medicine and science. Um, Justin was formerly um, a diplomat. He was embedded in a military unit that um, was in, uh, stationed in Afghanistan and later in Pakistan, these very food insecure parts of the world, and was uh, tasked with um, building infrastructure in these food insecure areas that uh, had been riddled with tribal warfare for, for generations, a lot of times just over food. Um, we met in 2011 at a dinner that neither of us really uh, was meant to be at, and it's moments like that that have made me just really afraid to say no to anything. Um, <laughs> just terrified. Um, I think that you know, it's in, in residency, it's very easy to just say, I'm so tired, I'm just going to go to sleep. Um, and, and it was a similar thing for him. And, uh, and yet, it was a, a moment that just changed everything for, um, for, for me, at least, for him, too. Um, so you know, how this all began was we would, we would talk about a lot of these emerging technologies. Um, I had gone back to visit my childhood home of Australia. And there are many parts that used to be rainforest and are now used to raise cattle. And as I was driving through some of these areas, this, this idea came to me of, can we eat meat without eating animals? Can we create the same thing just outside of the animal? And this idea was not one that I had thought of first in the world. Um, in fact, in, in 1931, Winston Churchill uh, described the absurdity of growing an entire chicken only to eat the wing or the breast. And this is the type of thing that's existed in, in, in science fiction, but hadn't really come to life in a, in a very real way. I'll, I'll describe a moment where, where it did in, in, in a moment, but I'll say that where this began was just curiosity. And curiosity drove us to find a place in San Francisco where you could actually rent lab space by the hour. And our bench was about the size of this podium, and it was just the the greatest place for me, for me to be. On nights and weekends, we would just congregate at this tiny little bench and talk about it like it was, you know, it was the lab where we were going to make all of the great discoveries. And it was that energy that, that still, from the very beginning in uh, 2016, that is still, I think, what just fuels us during times when things are not going so well. And I'll describe some of those. So the first thing we had to do once we um, were brought to the point of conviction that this was something we believed in, that this is something that could work, was to raise some money. And um, I was asked to describe a little bit, little bit about this. Um, this has been a bit of our, our journey so far. And I, I, I never would have thought that for this slide, the most interesting part <laughs> would be the bank. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, um, wow, what, what a week we had uh, at Wild Time. <laughs> um, I'm really glad to be here and uh, that we were able to, to pay our people. Um, but it was, it, was, it was pretty harrowing for, for a little while. Um, and, but what you'll see is that this actually is a pretty broad range of not just investors, as you think about investors, but, but interests. And, and why would these people be interested in something like this? And, and I'll say going out in Silicon Valley in the early days to, uh, and I say the early days, it was like 2017, to raise money, people thought, this is, this is an amazing idea. This is, this is really great. I mean, I mean, there are ways to create food now that uh, might not have some of the same consequences of, of our current system, but, but most importantly, the demand trends are ones that are, are, are the most convincing in terms of where, uh, the, the, you know, where, where, this is, where this is all going. And yet, nobody was interested in actually investing. 
um, the, the line we'd hear is, this is really wonderful and you seem very motivated, but let us know when you have a, a lead investor. Um, and eventually it did take a leap of faith um, by uh, one fund, and uh, as often happens in Silicon Valley, then others would follow. And um, this is kind of you know, what led us to be able to, to finally start building our team. And this was our little team in the early days. And when I say that everything was just permeated by this absolute air of just curiosity and excitement, this is, this is what it looked like. And that's Taryn by the microscope, who was the first person to join us. She was a fish developmental biologist who had studied hearing regeneration using fish as a model. And that's how incredible fish are. And I'll, I'll describe a lot more of that. But that's, that's some of the lessons we're able to learn from, from fish. And you know, the team grew a, a little bit more, but still in those early days, there was so much that we had to do on our own. This was, this was um, us preparing before a board meeting. And uh, Justin was making the sushi, and he has no idea how to make sushi. And I was, I was taking photos here. And, um, and, and what, I'll, what I'll say is our early prototypes of making this, and I'll describe how it happens, they you know, could, you really had to use your imagination to, to see what the promise was here. And so these early prototypes, they, they were not great. They, I mean, what is that? I, I don't know. I mean, uh, like, I, I was really, we were really proud of it at the time, and, and our investors were very kind to offer, you know, uh, <laughs> their kind words, but I'm sure they must have been wondering. <laughs> Um, is this actually ever going to turn into something that people are actually going to want to try? And speaking of unappetizing prototypes, I actually just want to go back for a moment. I mentioned Winston Churchill, and that was in 1931, and nobody uh, actually created a product like this until 2003. And so, like the wildest ideas in science, we always see them in art first. And this is Oren Katz. He is an artist uh, and a researcher at the University of Western Australia. And in 2003, he wanted to create an art demonstration. Um, he took a, a little biopsy from a frog's leg and grew those cells for about a month and then served it to diners uh, at this table and called it disembodied cuisine. <coughs> And, you know, I, I asked Oren, what, what was it like? And he said, you know, they spat it all out. And that's how I knew that what I had done was important and great. And the thing is, he was so moved by how repulsed people were. Now, the other part of this was the frog from which the biopsy was, was taken was actually watching people, that was in a little tank next to the table, and watching people eat uh, its cells um, and spit it out. And then afterwards, this was actually in, in Nantes, France, and, and afterwards the frog was released to a local garden. And I don't know, it might still be living a very happy life, but the, the, the idea was here was somebody who had actually gotten to something deeper, something that, that about our idea of meats and seafoods and where they come from and what does it mean when it's actually created outside of the animal? Is it the same thing? And so this is really what cellular agriculture is. And the way that it works, generally speaking, is that there'll be, it'll start with the cells. And um, you can select for a population of cells that will be able to self-renew and grow them in tanks that look like beer brewing tanks, and um, in some cases are. We grow them in, in tanks that uh, are fabricated by beer brewing fabricators. Um, and and it's, it's a basically, it's a very simple fermentative process. Um, I say simple, um, I'll talk about why it's, why it's not, but that's the first step. And the thing is that growing cells in a tank, just like growing yeast for, for beer in a tank, those cells don't know how to spontaneously organize and become sashimi. And for that, we need to provide them with a structure. And we use this plant-based structure, and we call it a scaffold, as basically the spatial cues for the cells to know where they should elongate, where they should uh, create fibers. You know, if we have soft scaffolds that are uh, um, high in fat, cells will behave more like 
fat cells. And, and that's kind of where this all begins. This, this was a photo I took of, um, of one of the, the juvenile fish that, that we had um, at wild type in the early days. And, uh, you know, in science experiments and, um, you know, it's, it's typically said you shouldn't, you shouldn't feel any attachment for, uh, for, for your experiment. Um, but it was hard uh, because these little fish were so cute and so wonderful and there was so much that we were learning from their incredible behavior. And, and this was when we think about the secrets of the sea that we've learned, for us it's through a microscope and through their cells. But, but this was something that one of the first moments where I've actually felt something that was a real affinity for, I did not mean that as a pun, uh, as, uh, for, 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 for these fish. Um, and as many of us know, you know, salmon, yeah, the fin thing. Um, as many of us know that, you know, salmon just have an absolutely extraordinary life cycle where they'll spend their early days in uh, these freshwater streams, go out to the ocean, go thousands of kilometers, somehow make their way back to the original stream from which they were, you know, in which they were born and spend their final days there. And there's a lot that we see when we grow the cells that speaks to that versatility of environments, that resilience that they have that is far greater than those of mammalian cells uh, such as ours. And so how are we able to achieve that kind of complexity for something like salmon? How can we take just these cells and actually guide them to become something as, uh, as, as complicated and, and interesting as, uh, as salmon? And so it, it really is with these four different aspects. And so when we think about cell lines, the very first step is just learning how to grow them. That's a, that's a difficult process. Um, for us to understand it, we went to papers from the 1960s and 1970s. And it was a, a very primitive approach of actually using parts of animal blood to, to, grow, um, to grow fish cells. And uh, that was typically cow's blood. And this idea of using cow's blood to grow fish cells, I mean, it, there, there are all kinds of problems with that. And you know, it was a long journey to get to the place where we no longer needed animal products to be able to, uh, to grow these cells. And in the early days, anytime you take a cell outside of an animal, it needs a surface to attach to. <coughs> Excuse me. And that means that typically these cells will grow on two-dimensional surfaces. And that means that in order to grow a lot of these cells, you need these sorts of shelves. And this is what it looked like in the early days. I mean, it was bonkers. There's no way that this is a scalable process. Uh, there's no way that this is something that can, can grow enough uh, cells to meet the demands of uh, you know, increased seafood consumption. And so it was, it was another journey to slowly, over the course of two years, convince these cells and teach them how to grow just in a three-dimensional solution. In these versus these aggregate cultures where they'd hold on to each other as a surface, and then eventually learn how to grow as single cells as well. I can spend hours talking about everything that went into it. And when people ask, how, how did you guys crack the code for something like this? Because I, I don't know of a, a case where that's happened for a marine species. Uh, there is no cracking of the code. I think that it really meant putting our minds into the lives of cells and trying to understand when they were happy, when they were not, how to sort of feed them the right things, how to create the right environments where they would feel comfortable just growing in these three-dimensional conditions. And then when you have them growing in this way, actually the environment you put them in leads them to behave very differently. So these are the same salmon cells, just grown on a different uh, scaffold. And you can see how different their appearance is. On the, the right, they're, they're growing into to these fibers that are um, just like muscle fibers. Um, and uh, they, they just will behave completely differently. And this is the beginning of, of understanding how to, how to grow this and, and put this together into what's a product. We also try to understand the different personalities of these cells. And by that I mean, which genes do they turn on? Which genes do they turn off? And this is an example of uh, a few different cell lines that we've developed. And this is just looking at um, genes that 
uh, will help the cells become muscle cells. And so some cells are just like super ready to become muscle cells. We're like just waiting for their moment to become a muscle cell. And you can see those are the higher graphs, uh, the higher bars. And then some are just really happy with a career that has nothing to do with muscle. And, and that kind of shows which cells are predisposed to, to one versus the other. And then when we think about this interaction between the cells and the structure, if you think about just the scaffold all the way to the left, that's kind of like a veggie burger. That has no cells at all. And then all the way on the right is something that is this perfectly tissue engineered uh, bit of muscle that if, if a, a salmon right now needed a transplant, we could, we could put that into that salmon and it could go swim away. And, and yet that's also not cost effective when we think about making a commodity product like salmon. And so all companies in this space are somewhere in between. And so when we think about what do we use to, to create these scaffolds, first of all, you have to be able to eat it because some of that scaffold will inevit in inevitably remain in, in the product. It needs to be cheap. It needs to be food great. It also needs to be something that the cells feel comfortable growing within. So most cells of animals hate to grow on plants. They just, they just don't like it. The proteins are, are so different. They, they, don't want their, they kind of get in there, and they're like, what, what, what is this? I, I don't want to be here. And so we need to be able to, to create these scaffolds that are inviting environments for, for the cells to grow within. And if you look at what this, um, how this plays out under a microscope, these green uh, dots here are cells. They're salmon cells. And if you look on the, the top left, that's you know, after a week, the cells have kind of attached. And you can see the fact that they have these uh, little processes coming out. Like That means that they are starting to feel comfortable. And in the top middle, that's after a month. Those cells are dividing. They're happy. That is a cell party up there. They're doing great. But the problem is, that's just on the top of the scaffold, right? That's just a sheet. Like, that, that's, that's not a piece of salmon. <laughs> that's some plant-based proteins with some salmon cells on top. That's like icing on the cake. And so we have to make scaffolds that encourage cells to actually integrate with it, to, to go with, within there. And that's, that's what, what you see on, on the bottom there. When we think about even creating that, it's, it's not it's not enough to see it under the microscope. And you know, there was this moment where we, um, a, we bought a, uh, what's called a texture analyzer that's basically a, um, a little probe that will um, go into uh, meat or seafood or whatever it is that you put there and will mimic your incisor or molar and give you a nice graph of exactly what that texture is. And so we, we, we did that. We, we went to the supermarket and got some salmon and, and threw it under there. And we're like, oh, this is the graph we need to achieve. And it took us months. And we did it. And it looked like this. We're like, wow, we are there. And then we, we, we tried it. And it tasted like nothing, nothing like salmon. Not just the, 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 the texture was off. It's like, is this thing broken? Why? Why? Why is it so different? And, and it, it's just not enough. It's not enough to, to understand. And what we found now is that through sensory panels and more sophisticated ways of looking at texture, um, gelation properties, things like rheology, is how we can understand some of these, these complexities. It might work for something like Doritos, but it won't work for something as, as complex as, nothing against Doritos, uh, as salmon. And then finally, what I wanted to say about just creating the product is, is one of when it comes to salmon and creating something that is grown outside of the animal, we really do eat with our eyes first. And there is such a wide range of what we're used to for, for salmon. There's even this thing called the Salmo fan that can, you can grade which, uh, you know, how orange or how red. And for us, we needed to think about what was it that we wanted to set as the gold standard. Um, as, as well as what is it that's special and distinctive about the appearance. And so um, a lot, the, the same natural component that uh, salmon will eat in the wild, which is a beta-carotene derivative, astaxanthin, um, is the same one that we will, will grow our cells in, for example. And we also create structures that uh, are like the white banding or striations that are between the, the different muscle fibers in order to create something that's that's just, you see it, and you're like, that's, of course, that's salmon. Like, what, what else could it be? 
But there are a lot of challenges, as you can imagine. This is, you know, um, uh, there's, this is early days for the entire industry. And, you know, one of those are actually just around regulation. So there is so much global demand for seafood, and the teams that are in charge of regulation are relatively small. We have been working with FDA for um, uh, over four years now, and I'll say that it's been an absolutely incredible process. Also things that I didn't think I would be saying. Um, they are just wonderful scientists who ask thoughtful questions throughout the entire process. But it's a small team, and you know, for more companies to be able to, to work with them, in many ways, they're understaffed. And there are new things that we need to think about for, uh, for paradigms of, of regulation. So just for example, um, in order to make DNA, we need the four bases of DNA. And if we think about something like thymidine, the T in, in DNA, that's something that's found in a quarter of all of our DNA. It's found in every single cell in every animal and plant on Earth. And yet, if we put it in the product for cells to make DNA, the FDA says, well, thymidine, that's, that's not a food ingredient. Like, what, how do we think about that? It's, it's part of DNA. It's, it's something that's, that's everywhere, and yet there's no regulatory precedent. There's also uh, this question of, you know, cells need um, things like insulin sometimes to grow. And FDA says, well, if you're going to use, you know, fish insulin to have these cells grow normally, the problem is that insulin is a drug, and foods can't be regulated as drugs in the US, and, and how should we be thinking about that? And, and, and these, are, these are fascinating questions. Um, there is also uh, just a lot of different definitions around what is um, a DNA sequence that's, that's found in, in the wild and how that might be different, and, and w if there is genetic engineering involved, uh, then you know, that's, that's a whole other set of you know, regulations and, and so forth. And then finally, what do we call this? So if this was salmon that was grown outside of the animal, like, is, it, is it salmon? I mean, it has salmon cells. If you're allergic to salmon, you're going to be allergic to this. But, but it's not harvested from, from an animal. Um, and so this is something that nomenclature is becoming a, a more important part of the conversation. And so one of the questions I was asked is, when, when will we see these products in the restaurant? And so this is, to be transparent, what our timeline looked like working with FDA. And it started at the end of 2019. Um, in January of this year, we submitted the, the answers to what we believe are the, the final questions to FDA. And when FDA has no more questions, that's when we'll be able to sell in restaurants. And that could be every day, any day. I've been checking my email every day, like, like, like checking the mailbox to see if I was going to get into college um, and, and just wondering. <laughs> When, when that would be. Um, so hopefully, hopefully very soon. And when we think about the future, um, I'm going to you know, show some headlines that make us sad um, in this industry, because I think that all aspects of the industry need to, to work together and succeed. Um, but it's also, I think, a, a, an opportunity for what's going to be really exciting. So there's, I think, a lot of disappointment in the plant-based uh, industry these days, maybe because people expected um, that in just a few years we'd be, be able to have these perfect replicas of uh, what is uh, you know, available um, as conventional meats and seafoods, and it takes time. But you know, just to think about the technology that we're describing and what we need to do. I just want to spend a moment talking about a few just calculations and assumptions. So these are very aggressive. If we were to create one industrial scale facility, it typically would cost more than $100 million. The number of companies in the space as of last year that have at least that much to, to be able to even build one of these in the world is, is five. Let's say that by the year 2027, there are 20 of these firms that can build something like this. And let's say that operating at full capacity, we're able to produce 20,000 tons of salmon, of beef, or whatever it is per year. And each of these companies is able to do this. All of these assumptions, again, super aggressive. The total amount of cultivated meat and seafood that's projected for 2027 
is this much. And what that means for our industry and what we would be producing is 0.08%. That's the reality. And so what that means is there's so much that we need to do to cultivate our industry's supply chain. We need to think about ways to not build the same old steel tanks. We need to think about ways of, instead of using pharmaceutical grade ingredients, using feed grade or food grade ingredients for some of these inputs. But mostly, what it means is that we need to work together. We need to work together with the conventional industries of fishing and aquaculture. This was the best part of my visit today, was actually talking about what it means to, to work together. These numbers and what these graphs represent, this shows that it, it, the, the, the demand that, that, that we are seeking to address is greater than any one of these industries is able to achieve. And this is why we're so excited to, to be working with different aquaculture firms, with different universities, with uh, just, just, just to come up with the kinds of answers we'll need to, to come up with together to be able to address this. Another way to put this is for us to produce just 1% of all of the seafood that's consumed in the world, just 1%, we would need all of the steel tanks in the world. So this is a way we need to think differently. And so when people ask, about is this a you know, Silicon Valley company seeking to disrupt? There's, there's nothing to disrupt here. We, we need all industries to succeed. And, and, and that's something that everyone at Wildtype believes. And our entire industry is one that is, is just absolute, like it, it, it doesn't matter which approach it is uh, that it'll take to get there. We, we will need everybody. And even that might not be enough. Um, and the thing is that what I described today was a lot of science. And I don't think anybody wants to eat a, a science experiment. Um, it, it's not appetizing when you think about it that way. It's not appetizing when you show cells. No, nobody want, nobody's excited about that. And I think what this takes is actually reconnecting with our food sources. And you know, these kind of agricultural, agricultural images, even if they're somewhat removed from what today's realities are for, for farming, they're still very powerful culturally in terms of our emotional connection to food. And we, we need to reconnect with food in that way. The, the beer brewery in the middle as well. That's something that people are very excited to go visit. The way that beer is made um, is not that different from, from what we create as well. And you know, on the right here, I think, is an example of that. And that's a children's book that came out last year that talks about where meat comes from. <clears throat> and it just describes cellular agriculture. It describes this process of taking a cell from a cow, growing the meat, and then being able to, to have it while the cow is still living a happy life. And this kid's book is the most wonderful, optimistic you know, thing. And, and it says, and, and how, how are the other ways in which meat are made? And it sort of ends by saying, like, well, we can talk about that another time. And, <laughs> And, and, and that's, that's actually you know, a beautiful way to, to describe this. Uh, you know, like we, we don't need to d describe all of the, the, the trouble and the doom and, 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 and everything, all the criticism that, that some of the current practices are like. We, we can actually just project optimism and, and think about a future that's much happier. And part of that is transparency. And so these are three, three examples. The, the, the left is um, our friends at Supermeat in Israel. Um, the middle is uh, a company that's across the bay from us, Upside Food. And uh, the right is um, our tasting room. And each one has this, this glass door where people who come there can have, in our case, sushi, and then see exactly how it's made. And we take tours, and people are able to sort of you know, ask questions about what goes into this? Who are the people who are making this? How do you get those white stripes to form? And, uh, and all these kinds of things. And, and I think that's where the conversation becomes most meaningful, when it starts with the food, and what is it that we're actually consuming, and how is it made? And this is something that you, you wouldn't see at a slaughterhouse. Like, you, you, you probably wouldn't have a tasting room like this and say, like, look, you know, this is, this is, this is how, how it happens. And that's, uh, you know, that's very specific for uh, the, the cattle industry. But what we need to do as just in, in general, not just our industry and our field, but collectively, is actually just make 
great food. And, and uh, I think that's where all of this begins. Um, this is something I think we can, we can all agree on. And so this is, this is the team right now. I think if you ever have the chance to come to San Francisco, um, we'd love to host you. We'd love to show you around. Please, please get in touch. Um, I, I really believe this is just the beginning. I'm uh, excited to hear your, your thoughts and questions. And just wanted to say thank you so much again. <laughs> much. It was amazing, fantastic. Um, we will have a series of questions. I just would like to remind the audience that our next lecture is going to be on April 11. It will be given by one of our faculty, Dr. Sharan Majumda, who is going to be speaking about the resilience, climate resilience, and the projects that uh, we have at the University of Miami on that. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Jennifer, who is going to, uh, who is our executive director of advancement, and she will organize the questions. Again, thanks, Ari. Maybe I'll take the opportunity to ask the first question, uh, if you do not mind. Uh, just, uh, uh, you know, I'm curious about the comparison that you make with the brewery, and it sounds to me that the breweries around the world are capable of providing the beer that everybody wants to drink, and that's, that's a lot. So if we were going to transform all those breweries into fish production, that's maybe a way, okay, to think about, uh, 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 not that the people would, uh, would not, but I mean, from a technological point of view, it's not impossible to think about that. And uh, the other part that I have, also the other part of my question is, how much time does it take from the basic cell until you can produce a piece of sushi that you put on your plates? In other words, the production, the, the, the duplications and production of each uh, a meal. How much time does it take? Thanks. Yeah, th th these are amazing questions. And I I'd say that the beer analogy uh, does hold up um, up until the moment that you start to consider um, the yield. And by that I mean yeast are really great at growing in fermenters. And salmon cells um, just really are not. They're so much slower. And the amount of cells we're able to get for every liter of nutrients is far less. And so I think that's, unfortunately, the, the biggest challenge. And actually, what people have projected is the biggest challenge for the industry in terms of achieving viable unit economics, in terms of being able to compete with conventional salmon. And the time it takes to, to create something like this um, it's typically something like four to six weeks, um, and it's something that obviously will depend on if you have a 2,000 liter tank that's already going with a bunch of cells, uh, you can take a lot of those and sort of create a product faster, but um, it's, on, it's on the order of weeks, and it, it really depends on the kinds of products that uh, we make, but that's, that, you know, that, that's the range. Thank you. I'm not, do you still have your thing? I on? shut mine off. So you want to turn it out on a little bit? or we can, I'll ask the questions through here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some questions from the audience here. If you have a question, raise your hand, and we'll bring the microphone around. And we also have questions from our Zoom audience. And so we'll, I'm going to take one of those because the other night we didn't get to ask any questions from our Zoom audience, and I felt really bad about that. So let me, let me start with one of them here. Someone asked, um, how do the nutritional components, example, vitamins, minerals, caloric content, et cetera, of animal source versus lab factory source meat compare? Yeah, that's such an important question. Um, we don't want to be making a product that uh, is inferior in terms of uh, any of the nutritional aspects. And so um, when it comes to the fats, for example, um, it's at the same level, uh, including omega-3, omega-6s, omega-9s, and, and so forth. Um, at one point, it was, it was a little bit higher, and people asked, like, well, can you, cre can you create something that has you know, 10 times as much vitamin C and 100 times as much omega-3s, and, and we can, but we, we don't want to make a multivitamin. You know, we want this to be something that, that is, is natural in that way. Um, some of our, uh, you know, early stage products are lower in protein. Some are actually exactly nutritionally equivalent, but, but it's something that is a, a top priority when we look at developing these products, is, is creating all of the nutritional components without, of course, um, 
some of the uh, some of the compounds that are in our seafood system that um, you know don't need to be there. If we have an audience, we have a couple of hands up here. Yes, um, I heard you mentioning that with about one percent, you'll be providing food for about one percent of what is uh, supplied now. If you had all the breweries, but in a perfect world. If you had all the funding you need, how would you be able to scale this to produce the product faster? I, I love that question. Um, it really means redesigning the way that we grow these cells. So instead of growing cells in a uh, tank and then taking those cells, putting them onto a scaffold, waiting a certain amount of time, having something that is integrated, using materials that are not steel, using, um, you know, like, ultimately this might someday in the future be such a distributed model of production that instead of your bread maker in your kitchen, you have a salmon maker and you have a starter salmon cell uh, culture. Like, there, there are creative ways to, to think about this. And, um, you know, like, I think that that's, that's the part that's most exciting. It's not replicating the fermentative, you know, fermentative processes of, of brewing. It's how can we think about this in a completely different way. Okay, the, uh, this is from the Zoom audience. Do you have to use drugs such as antibiotics to prevent disease in the cells? No, we haven't used antibiotics for years. Um, we just keep the environment so clean um, and uh, make sure that when we are moving our cells from one tank or one vessel to another, that it's done with complete sterile technique, um, that we don't use antibiotics at all. In the supermarket, uh, animal sourced salmon is a couple feet long, beautiful slab. I'm assuming that your uh, structures are smaller, but what is it an individual slice that you produce? Yeah, so the thing about being able to create a scaffold or a structure for the cells is that we can choose whatever form factor we would like. Um, to start with, we're working with something that's called a saku, or you know, a block that uh, sushi chefs are most you know, comfortable using, uh, just because it's a, it's a smaller form factor. But ultimately, if we create uh, the plant-based structure for the cells to grow within, we can, we can have the same thing, yeah. Thank you. Having been a fisherman and a diver in the South Florida area, Caribbean Sea, sea for many years, uh, seeing the difference in the fish here and the salmon, what, what is, how much more difficult is it to produce what you're going to produce from a salmon to a local fish that is known here as a, uh, from the snapper family called a hog snapper, which is now selling for $20 a pound? I, I, I've just learned about some of these species that honestly, in, like, I, I, I hadn't even known about. Um, I think that while similar principles apply in terms of understanding how these cells grow, providing them with the right nutrients, and understanding that these are truly different animals and will require uh, you know, a completely new set of um, you know, essentially processes to, to see like which sugars do they like to, um, to, to metabolize, which fats do they prefer. It's, it's the same idea, but we can't take shortcuts because it is an entirely different animal with a totally different set of you know, culinary characteristics and, and, and properties. Hi. Wonderful presentation. And you're not old enough to have done what you've already done. I'm, Stop. I'm sorry. Um, in an ideal world, Will this replace fishing? Will this cut down on the drag lines? Will, will this, you talked in the beginning about the pollution from drag fishing and how it's greater than airlines. I was staggered by that. Will it cut down on that? Will it replace fishing? Or what you're gonna do is it gonna augment everything? I hope this does not replace fishing. I think that people who are good stewards of the ocean, who care, who care about the number of fish that come out of the water every year and make sure not to exceed the, the numbers that, that they know are the right numbers, should be able to charge a premium that's far greater than what our fish go for today. I think that fishing should absolutely be an incredible industry that thrives, that thrives in the way that communities that rely on fish 
uh, are able to, have been able to keep fishing alive for, for so long. This technology at its best will take some of the pressure off the oceans. Hopefully just being able to appease some of the demand that's, that's going up. But in terms of, I, I really hope uh, something like this never replaces fishing. Probably enough for one more question. Okay, last but not least, uh, a practical question. Uh, where can we go locally to taste some of your salmon? <laughs> yeah, so, so we have to wait for that email from, from the FDA. Um, <laughs> is a, uh, I'll let you know, I can forward it to you when we get it. But, um, you know, once, once that goes through, there are going to be a few, re we're still very much supply constrained. It's pretty difficult for us to, to make a lot. Um, but there will be a handful of restaurants that will be announcing. Um, uh, we, we actually don't have our um, uh, a Miami restaurant yet, um, but uh, maybe that's, that's something we can work on together uh, uh, tonight. Um, but it'll be a handful of restaurants across the country. Um, I think that restaurants are a place where the story of what this is can be told rather than putting it straight in the supermarket where people don't have the context to, to know how that's different from conventional seafood. Thank you. Very, that's been very inspiring. If you guys liked uh, tonight's presentation and or you have friends that you'd like to share this with, it'll be on our YouTube channel in the coming days and we also follow up with an email. Uh, thank you so much and join us again next time on the 11th.